Where Did the Road Go is brought to you in part by our Patreons. This month in particular is being sponsored by Eric Hervin, Super Inframan, Allison Cook, and Lindsay Marie Trebet. If you would like to become a Patreon, get extra content, and help this show grow, you can do so at wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I am talking with Mr. John Tutor. Hello, John. Hi there. And it's been a while since you've been on. And uh, you had been talking to me about Mother Shipton. And this was something I've heard about off and on th- for a long time, but didn't know a whole lot about. And you've, uh, you've done quite a bit of research on this. I've been I've been digging around through six hundred years of documents. It's yeah. quite interesting. You learn quite a lot on the way, you know, that you weren't expecting. Well, sure. Uh, so I so mean, who, it's who was sorry? she? Who was she? <clears throat> well, Old Mother Shipton. Hmm, depends on which version of the legend you believe, if any. Um, she was born. Uh, to a, an unmarried mother called Agatha, which apparently she had uh, been having sex with the devil, depending oh. on which version you believe. Yeah. <laughs> and she was born in a cave just outside Nairsborough, which is near York. Most American people have heard of York, I think. It's about 15 miles from York. And she's born in this cave. And apparently, at the moment she was born, there was a crack of lightning, a strong smell of sulfur, and she was born. And the mother either died or was taken off to... Uh, a monastery where she died two years later, depending on which version you want to go with, right? Mm -hmm. So she was born extremely ugly. Her legs were twisted to the left. So when she stood up facing you, it looked like she was going to disappear off stage right. (laughs) Um, She had a very hooked nose, a sticky out chin, uh, but apparently was supposed to be a very bright young young girl and very likable and extremely kind, but exceedingly ugly. Every single reference to her is that she's very ugly. She then uh, married a guy called Toby when she was 25, so it didn't put somebody off. Um, she had no children. And he died not long after, as people did in those days. Um, And she went to go back and live in the cave where she was born, which is still there to this day, and you can pay a few bucks and go and have a look, yeah? Um, So that's who she was. Her mother had one of two surnames, one of which was Sothiel, S-O-T-H-E-I-L. And the other version you see in the documents was Soothtel. S-O-O-T-H. Uh, Sooth. Yeah. E-L-L. Hmm. Soothtel. Which, fortune teller. Yeah? Yeah. A sooth teller. So, presumably it was in her, her mother's... Um, background that uh, comes from a line of uh, you know fortune tellers I suppose mm-hmm. so that's who that's who she was um, and I'm gonna skip forward a few jumps and then come back to it on the way in more detail does that make sense and yep, um, to- yep it's fine, totally fine 
Okay, so um, she lived in this cave, and I've put in the show notes some pictures of the cave where she lived, and um, a couple of videos of wandering around it, mm-hmm. and, and very that, close and, to. Yeah, and that's at where does the road go? I'm sorry, that's at where does the dot com. If anyone wants to look at that. Yeah, um, much of the documents that I'm going to talk about, I've put either copies of or links to them, a couple of videos as well, and a timeline, an interactive timeline of the event so that you can... It's quite difficult when you're looking at things like um, predictions as to where things lie on the timeline, especially if it's not your country, yeah? Yeah. Because this is all in the UK. And whilst I know you guys study history before... America being British to the annoyance of other people, I gather. Um, <laughs> so some of it will be familiar to, to you guys and, uh, and, and some won't. So we have this woman and she came out with a load of prophecies, which are in verse, in almost verse, or probably was in verse if you had the right accent at the time, yeah? Right. Um, They describe all sorts of things, and if you go to the most recent versions of her story, she was said to have predicted submarines, aircraft, the internet, and I'll read some of those in a, in a few moments, okay? Right. But you were saying, who was she? Well, that's that's who she was. All accounts say that she was extremely kind to everybody and very pleasant and very bright. So although she's very ugly, um, she was generally considered to be a good person, right? Mm-hmm. So where are we? Let me just... Right. Now, why are we talking about this today? Well, today, to all intents and purposes, certainly here at my time at the moment, we are talking Halloween. Samain. Right. Except it's not pronounced that way. If, you, if you're English and you see it spelt, you will say Samain. But actually, in the Gaelic, it's so n or sa in depending on whether you're Scottish or or Irish. Mm-hmm. But nevertheless, that is where all this started. And that, of course, well, say, of course, some people won't know, is they believe, the Celts believed, that the earth um, was, was in the year, it was a, was a cycle, and it was joined together to complete the circle And where it joined together was weak, or liminal is the word used. And Mm -hmm. so at this joint in the year, this is the Celtic end of the old year, the beginning of the new year, and it's today. Um, And at this point, the space between our reality and the other world, whatever you want to call it, is very thin and things can op between the two realities, for want of a better word. Right. So that's either good or bad, depending on where you are in the world. (laughs) And if you want to see your granddad or you want to keep the devil away, depending on how you feel about it. So, well, the Christians came along, hijacked it, attached all hallows to it the following day um and people will go to church and pray for the soul certainly in southern europe of their grandparents or their dead parents or you know that kind of thing um and some people will say they they see their grandparents on the way back from the pub who've been dead for 10 years um there are stories on this day that if you're a young girl and you sit by a mirror with candlelight and you look over your shoulder at your reflection 
well you're brushing your hair you'll see the spirit of the person you're going to marry so that's jolly good isn't it mm. so th that's at what we do but it's also interesting that on historically on the same day because is diwali or dipali depending on which part of india you're from which is the indian festival of lights mm -hmm. which is kind of on the same day if you follow the lunar cycle yeah which the celts did and the uh you were me it, it the celts didn't have it nailed to 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 this date you see what i mean so it was yeah, like yeah, near yeah. The moon. so but the the indians do exactly the same and on the same day to all the intents and purposes they have the end of their year and the beginning of the next year and they have the festival of lights just like we have you know fireworks and bonfires and things for halloween so this must go back an awful long way you know yeah it's exactly the same festival as that now you don't want if the if there's a crack in the uh temporal time rift as doctor who would have it you you don't really want <laughs> nasty things coming through the rift at you and so what you want to do is to scare them away so people would in the middle ages gather at the churchyard with you know tin cans and sticks and paint their faces and make themselves look as scary as possible and run around the village to ward off evil spirits because you don't want evil spirits invading you and this was a christian thing but i right. know this now that a lot of baptists have decided that they're celebrating the devil but actually they're chasing the devil away hmm. now what's that got to do with old mother shipton well old mother shipton had the hook nose the jutty out chin and she has been shown wearing a witch's hat except that in the woodcuts her witch's hat is like cut off with a pair of scissors at the top oh so it doesn't actually go to a point um which is just like the there are hats exactly the same worn by the welsh especially yes the welsh ladies you know on like national when they're wearing national costume which is goes up like a witch's hat black and is snipped off at the top it's almost exact well it is the same yeah yeah so if you go to uh pennsylvania avenue tonight um you know you might find um the devil and all his works and uh and a woman next to him but they're expecting young children to knock on the door i was reading about that so so trump's actually scaring the heck out of kids like he's been doing to me for the last five years and he's doing it tonight <laughs> so those kids a lot of those are going to be dressed up as a witch and the witches that we traditionally see like the wicked witch of the west in the wizard of oz with the hook nose and the sticky out jaw and the you know the spiky hat is exactly what the woodcuts have shipped and look like so how do we get from there to seven-year-old girls running around looking like old mother shipton yeah well right well old mother shipton became very famous with a early stories and people i'll come to i'll come to who and when in a minute but she there were notable people picked up on her and it got noted in in famous diaries and things which i'll which i'll come to in, in a little bit but more importantly it is thought that william shakespeare picked up the three witches in macbeth from old mother shipton because old mother shipton was the archetypal witch if you thought of a witch in those times it was her you thought of yeah so you've got the three witches you know with the eye of newt and all this in macbeth mm -hmm. 
tackling away and brewing up stuff with Ive Newton, whatever they were, whatever they were making, or Mulligatawny soup or whatever it was. <laughs> and so then we have it now imprinted in the British psyche or the English psyche that this is what a witch looks like because it was all over the London stage at the time, yeah? And so it, it drizzled on and reinforced, of course, by, by Hollywood in the 30s with the Widows of Oz. And now we have little girls dressing up as Old Mother Shipton with no idea that that's who they're dressing up as. Hmm. So that's what joins today with Old Mother Shipton. Okay, so far, or have I lost you? No, I'm following. Yeah. Right, let me pull up a, a one of her first... Um, Prophecies? I've got, I've got a lot of documents here. Hold on a second. Well, let's let's start with some of the some of the ones that are, are are well known. A carriage without a horse shall go. Disaster filled the world with woe. In London, Primrose Hill shall in centre hold a bishop's see. I'll come back to that because I found something else interesting about that. I think that's a misprint. Around the world, men's thoughts will fly, quick as the twinkling of an eye, and water shall great wonders do. How strange, and yet it shall come true. And people have uh, thought of that is the telephone, television, radio, internet, hydroelectric dams, harnessing waterfalls, and so on. Um through towering hills proud men shall ride no horse or ass move by his side beneath the water men shall walk shall ride shall sleep shall even talk and so it goes on i'll just pick out a couple of others and in the air men shall be seen in white and black and even green and great men a great man shall come and go for prophecy declares it so in water, iron then shall float, as easy as a wooden boat. Gold shall be seen in stream and stone, in land that is not yet known. And that is the Victorians thought that that referred to the Californian gold rush. Ah, okay. Um, iron ships, well, we're familiar with those at the moment um well it, it goes on and on a wall i mean i'm skipping lines down here now right a right. wall will follow with the work where dwells the pagan and the turk a house of glass shall come to pass in england but alas alas um this is thought to describe the giant glass atrium in london called crystal palace which was one of the first you know the great exhibition of 1851 uh, mm. which was a massive building even by today's standards and um after th the exhibition was in hyde park and it was massive if you see i mean there are photographs of it existing it's absolutely massive um it was basically it was a big exhibition hall built for the purpose and when it was finished they uh uh, took it away and they uh, moved it to what, a place that's now called Crystal Palace, which is in the south of London in a park, and it burnt down in 1936. So that actually existed. And, you know, so it goes on. And British olives shall then twine in marriage with the German vine. Men, be men walk beneath and streams fulfilled shall be their wondrous dreams, believed to be Queen Victoria, Prince Albert, who were German Habsburgs, changed their name later, and so it goes on. And women shall adopt a craze to dress like men and trousers wear and cut off locks of their hair and they'll ride astride with brazen brow as witches do on broomsticks now. And so it goes on. There's yards of that stuff. So what do you make of that? 
Well, like a lot of this stuff, it's so open to interpretation. Hmm. Well, this particular bit was made up. Hmm. <laughs> okay. By a guy called Hick Chris Hinkley. And what had happened was that the the original ones there weren't very there wasn't very much of them, and then they were reprinted and reprinted, and people added bits. But in fairness, they they said they gathered them from other local sources and added to them. But the stuff I've just read was printed after every single one of those things had happened. Hmm. Interesting. Right? Fake news. <laughs> the whole thing is fake news. Yeah. Um, the, you know, England shall admit a Jew. You think it's strange, but this is true. He shall be the, of a Christian born. Well, that's the Israeli. Yeah. Mm. Um, it, at the time that they printed this book, every single one of those things had happened. People had been diving under the sea. They had built iron ships. Yeah, The telegraph and even the telephone was working in those days. Right. And that was added by this guy, Chris Hinckley, in the Victorian, late Victorian times. Um, and he... You could tell it was true because it said on it the complete truthful version. So obviously, <laughs> you'd, you'd you'd believe that. And then at the end of this, it it says that the uh, the world will uh, will end in um, this particular version will end in uh, eighteen sixty one. Mm. which is about 19 years after it was printed. Because, uh, you know, you want to rev everybody up, and everybody really wanted to find out what was going on. Right. And you might think that would be the end of it, but no. No, 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 no. Somebody else gets hold of it in about 1910 and thinks they'll give another spin of the wheel to it. And change the date for the end of the world to 1926. And then somebody a bit later thought it was worth another turn of the wheel and made it um, 1936. <laughs> so, and you might think that's the end of that. But if you look around, you'll find there's a guy in India who has taken, which is copyright free stuff, yeah? Okay. And he's now publishing it on Amazon, on Lulu, you know, on their, their thing, yeah? Mm -hmm. And and I'm, I'm told there's even extra stuff in it. But some of it wasn't written by this guy. And it describes the end of the world, but he did admit to changing the date. Um. And here we have, uh, because this was actually from a different source. Um, uh, where are we? Where does it start? Uh, right. It starts off with a load of... Um, it, this is basically supposed to be set after the 20th century. Um, it says, Storms and will rage and oceans roar when Gabriel stands on sea and shore. And he blows his wondrous horn, old worlds die, new to be born. Of course, that's straight out of Revelation. Yeah. Okay. It says, A fiery dragon shall cross the sky six times before the earth shall die. Mankind shall tremble and frightened be for six heralds in this prophecy. Um, the particular thing I'm reading, the note says, it's a series of comets like you saw with with um, Hale Bop, but knowing what I've read about comets, and you know I've been looking at comets, yeah. it's probably just something circling on the way in, yeah? Right. Um, uh 
and it says for seven days and seven nights men will watch this awesome sight and tides will rise beyond their ken in other words they've never seen anything like it before to bite away the shores and the mountains roar and earthquakes split the plain to the shore tidal waves and continual wars and so it goes on uh when the dragon's tail is gone hang on men flee in terror from the floods and kills and rapes and lies in blood and spilling blood by mankind will stain and bitter many lands and it, it it goes on like that for quite some time um being horrible and then it says <laughs> but who survives this and then there's an unreadable thing nobody can read then begins the human race again not on land already here but on ocean beds stark dry and bare yep so new land that's been brought up out of the sea not every soul on earth will die as the dragon's tail goes sweeping by not every land on earth will sink and so on and it goes on about horrible dis descriptions of rotting bodies crisp vegetation and out of it um, a new race arises and a spit silver s serpent comes to view and spew out men of like unknown to mingle with the earth now grown cold from its heat and these men c can enlighten the minds of future man hmm. so there you go you got you got everything you want there you've got uh, <laughs> flying, flying saucers aliens the end of the world gabriel what more do you want yeah and then a golden age will start in you with about 10 percent of uh having having survived so now that that's one of genuinely one of hers who knows mm. all i'm saying is it's not part of the bit that anybody else can see owned up to hmm it, uh, it, it sounds like the civilizer story you get from the end of the last ice age well it, it sounds exactly like the atlanteans for the want of a better word turning up in the levant and being the watchers and showing them how to grow stuff and yeah yeah um so is it made up well i don't know because it it doesn't appear in the early texts hmm but uh and it doesn't appear to be in a bit that was owned up to what the guy did own up to was changing the date yeah okay uh like it, i don't think the original if there was an original original it probably didn't have a date at all do you see what i mean just like okay. yeah yeah happen. Uh, but of course if you're trying to sell a book you want to push it you know 20 years away so you're not scaring everybody <laughs> <laughs> yes the apocalypse is always around the corner but not too close yeah that, that's right because uh, we got books to sell right uh, <laughs> right so um <sighs> Yeah, the the original one. I'm, I'll read you the original, the original okay. one in a minute. The there was a guy called John Head in a I've forgotten the year now, fourteen sixty something or other, who added a lot. Um, and if you look at people who've looked at these things, they just write it off as well he made it up yeah yeah but he didn't actually say he made it up he said he added it f based on um information told to him you were me from the area mm. so whether he added it from what was in the area or just made it up will we ever know and when did he write this? Uh, 1461, I think. Okay, so that's really early on. 
No, no, sixteen forty one. Well, she was really. born, she was born in fourteen eighty eight. Okay. So I mean, we're and doing this on the hoof, and my notes are all over the place here, so uh, bear with me what I find. I mean, uh, we thought we'd do it on a sort of organic way. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so where were these, these writings found? They were found in her cave after she died? There, there's reference to, like, a bundle of scrolls, yeah? And the one part of it didn't show up until much later when it was found in in the wrapping of the scrolls itself, yeah? Mm. And that bit describes, and the Victorians are very excited about that because they said, look at that, it, uh, it describes the uh, printing press and it hadn't been invented. So I checked that out. Yes, it had. Yeah. <laughs> it had been invented um, sometime before the death of, um, of, of Mother Shipton. Yeah. And she'd uh, brought, he'd already printed his, his first book. Because what he did was he went to Germany and bought a Gutenberg press. Yeah. He did a course in it, came back and started printing stuff. And the first thing he printed was the Bible. And I think the second thing he printed was a naughty book. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah, I'm not kidding. Yeah. And then um, uh, and what she's saying is that uh, nobody will see this for, you know, three generations after after I'm gone. And by that time there'll be machines um, printing this so that people won't have to write and copy it, yeah? So that is mm. indeed what happened. So what can I say? I'm having a bit of trouble here. What's the matter? My desktop is frozen. <laughs> I, You know, I mean, also being as smart as it says she is, some of this stuff would have been predictable to a degree. Well, it's very predictable if you wrote it in the middle of the Victorian era when most of it had happened and had it on. I mean, that's like... Right. You can do a 100% um, hit rate. Accuracy, one. yeah, totally. Yeah. Right, I better explain who the characters are, I suppose. Henry VIII, you've heard all about, you know, mm -hmm. six, six wives and... Um, right. Threw chickens everywhere and general pain in the backside. Um and he dissolved the Catholic Church in Britain, confiscated all the goods, um, and basically that's why you well you've got the Episcopalian Church over there, and we've got the Anglican Church here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, one of his chief henchmen was Cardinal Wolsey, who uh, basically did all the dirty work and did the negotiations with the Pope. Uh, weaponized some uh, papal language, gave it to the king so that he could write weaponized uh, nasty letters to the Pope and, you know, get divorced a few times and eventually tell him to uh, go away and uh, he'll be the, uh, the leader of the British church, right? Mm. Now, so Cardinal Wolsey is basically a very bright fixer and whilst he was not personally a thug he certainly employed thugs okay okay so that's who he is um there are other people mentioned like lord percy and lord darcy it doesn't matter for the purposes of this but they were uh do you do you watch Blackadder in America? Uh, I know it's available. I don't watch it. Well, to those that watch it, you'll find that Lord Percy and Lord Darcy are in it. Uh, so if you want to know more about Lord Percy and Lord Darcy, don't listen to Blackadder because it's, <laughs> it's not necessarily true, but it's funny. Anyway, so here we go. Uh, so those these are, these are real people. And... Uh, 
Where are we? They had heard about this uh, uh, this witch of the north. Yeah, these guys. And uh, she had said that Cardinal Wolsey would never come, would never get to York. That's one of her prophecies was, uh, well, you know, he might be coming to York. Don't, don't forget that York was going to be the number two church. Yeah, our number one church is not Westminster Abbey, which a lot of Americans think. It's Canterbury Cathedral. Okay. Mm, okay. Our second one is York Minster. Now, York Minster isn't actually a cathedral. It's a minster, which means it's actually a parish church, but a big one. Do you with me? Yeah. Like super-sized church. It's not actually a cathedral. There are reasons for that, but it doesn't matter. But the point is that if they're going to break away, you and me, from, from Rome, you've got to secure and have on side York and Canterbury at the minimum, right? Mm -hmm. So Cardinal Wolsey's got to get to York. But she said, she she made him one of her prophecies that he wouldn't he wouldn't get to York. Well, Cardinal Wolsey heard this, which is interesting, because he's in London, right? Mm -hmm. So, if she made a prediction, people were listening, weren't they? Right. And a long way away. Well, he was angry, and he sent Duke of uh, Suffolk, the Lord Percy, and Lord Darcy to see her, and they came disguised um, to... Uh, and they went up there anyway and they went to see Master Becklesley and I don't know he was some big wig and uh, desired with them to go to he was probably he's probably a noble who knew where Mother Shipton lived you know what I mean so yeah. they went to Mother Shipton's house because by then she had moved out of the cave and into a house yeah where they came and knocked on the door and she said, come in, Master Besley, and the noble lord's with you. And Master <laughs> Bexley, um, you know, normally would have let the lords go in before him. But she said, come in, Master Master Besley, you know the way in, and they don't. And this they thought strange, that she knew them, but had never seen them before. And they went into the house, and there's a big fire, and she built no, But there's a red flag right there, because Bexley was supposed to know the way, and he said he's never been there. Right, red flag. I mean, right there in the story. Um, yeah. Right. So he'd been there. I mean, was he the source, you and me, of the 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 method by which the prophecy got to uh, Wolsey? You ah, I see. Yeah. And then he sent he said, Well, you know, here here my my, my three trusty fellas or two trusty fellas or whatever. Yeah, get up there, go and see Besley, find out what it's all about. Yeah. So I'm just <laughs> filled that in myself because I otherwise I don't understand the point of it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, they thought this is strange because they'd never been there before. Um and Bexley said he hadn't either, right? So anyway, they were and she said uh, anyway, the Duke of, of Suffolk, the Lord Percy, he says, he said, well, you're making us very welcome, but um, if you knew what we came for, you wouldn't make us so welcome. And she said, well, the messenger should not be hanged. Or as we would say today, don't hang the messenger, right? Um, right, right. And she said, you said that the Cardinal should never see York. She said... Yes, yes, she said. He might see York, but he'll never get to it. But the, I, I'm paraphrasing this from Middle English, right? Mm -hmm. She said, "Well, the the Duke, the Duke says when he gets to York, you're going to be burnt." And she said, "Well, we'll see about that." And she took off her handkerchief off her head. God knows what she's got handkerchief. Wasn't it anyway? And threw it on the fire, and it wouldn't burn. And then she took her staff and th and turned it in the fire, and that wouldn't burn. And then she took it out and put it on again. And she said, <laughs> "The Duke said, well, what, what do you mean by this?'" And she said, "Well, if this had burned, I might have been burned, but it didn't." So 
Mother Shipton said the Duke, what do you think of me? Love, she said, the time will come when you are as low as I am, and that's a low one indeed. And Percy said, well, what do you say of me? And she said, shoe your horse in the quick, and you should do well, but your body will be buried in York pavement, and your head shall be stolen from the bar and carried into from Middle English. It's either palace or paradise. Anyway. Ah, okay. Um, and then he said to Lord English, to Lord Darcy, what do you think of me? And she said, you have made a great gun. Shoot it off for you will do no good. You are going to war. You will pain many a man, but you will kill no one. And they left and went away. So, right, there's some prophecy there, right? So, mm -hmm. not long after, the cardinal went to Corwood and goes to the top of the tower and he asked where York was. Right, so Cardinal Wolsey he's now come to basically that neck of the woods. Yep, they climb up a tower. He said, how far is York? Alf and Wolsey said that one had said he should never see York. No, said, no, said the, the other guy. She said you might see York, but never come to it. Hmm. And he had vowed to burn her when he came to York. So they showed him York. And at that point, it was eight miles thence. And he said he will soon be there. But he gets sent for by the king. And he gets summoned to London, so he didn't get to York. And on the way back at Leicester, he dies of a lask. Now, a lask is also the flux. Basically, he got diarrhoea and died. So that could be cholera, I, I don't know. Upsets, yeah, any kind of... Yeah. Any, any kind of thing that dehydrates you to death. And uh, Shipton's wife says, um, Yonder is a fine stall built for the cardinal. Uh, that's that's from another bit of the prophecy. Um, they made a, a a toilet for the cardinal, yeah, mm -hmm. um, with gold and pearl and precious stones. Um, and you know that that's what made up the pillars of the basically the toilet, yeah. Okay. And she said, well, you know. Go and go and take one of the pillars from the toilet and take it to uh, King Henry, and she did. So I don't suppose he was very pleased to get that. That's that's an I told you so. I reckon, yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Master Beasley, having seen these things fall out as she had foretold, desired to tell him more of her prophecies, and she said, "Before that, O's Bridge now O's." O W E S is now the river Ouse O U S E, yeah, mm. okay. bridge. Um, uh, well, I'll cut it. I won't read it all out because it's yards of stuff. But basically, it comes down to um, the uh, the highest stone of Trinity Church will be the lowest stone of Ouse Bridge. So, the Trinity Church, you and me, falls down and is you were me into the river and is lower than you uh, Ruse bridge and in later mm. things it says that the Ouse, the Ouse bridge will be rebuilt twice and destroyed three times before the end of the world well it's already been destroyed twice wow uh, and some guy being very enterprising has built a pub right by the bridge and called it the world's end and you can go there and get yourself a pint. Because that is where the end of the world will happen according to to her. So it goes on and on and on. From hmm. there on, there's a yard of it, right? Um, okay. More, well, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what reading it all out really proves i mean that there, there are things with that say that the um, the scots will rule over the english yeah and there's a mm -hmm. and there's a battle lost 
and another battle begins where Crookback Richard, that is of course Richard the Third, yeah, the Hunchback. Yeah, there'll be another battle there, and so on, and so on, and so on, and it goes on and on. And basically, it in a nutshell, it describes the battles and the route by which um, James the First of Eng of England and James the Fourth of Scotland is the same guy. Yeah, okay. um, basically becomes king and um unifies the the kingdom and here it is basically foretold in some detail and there's a few random things in it like there shall be a child born in Pant pontifract with three thumbs i'm hmm. not sh i'm not sure what i do with that and um <laughs> Three, three, three knights will give him three horses to hold and they will win England and all noble blood shall be gone but one and they shall carry him to Nutton's Castle, which doesn't exist, but Hutton's Castle does, from York and he shall die and so on, yeah? But okay. when you actually boil it all down, it, 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 bearing in mind that she's in Henry VIII's reign, at this mm -hmm. point and then we have elizabeth and henry the eighth had a son who was sickly and he lasted about 10 minutes yeah right and then we then we had um ugh. well then it got silly and and then we had um the scottish king becoming the english king as well uh thus making uh, effectively the british isles from england and scotland right mm -hmm. and that's what this foretells in some some of it's cloudy and some some isn't i mean it describes stoke and Moor, a battle at stoke and Moor, uh which happened but it's spelt wrong um but then spelling was optional in those days right, you know right. i mean it, it was very phonetic um and this was also printed. I've got an actual scan of the original print, um, which is what I'm reading from. Uh, I mean, now is, yeah. is this so, one so, of the, so, is this one of the PDFs that's up on the on the notes yeah. on the website? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. This is this is you'll find two called this. This is the uh, the the um, uh, prophecy of. Mother Shipton in the reign of King Henry the Eighth. Okay. So that's there in two forms. One is a visual scan, yeah, and the other is the text as a text file, right? Okay. So uh, that is online. How are we doing on time? Because I've lost the plot now. Oh, I <laughs> see. We got like twenty minutes or so left. Okay. Right. So. This is what got everybody's attention. I mean, there must have been more prophecies before this. Otherwise, why would Woolsey take any notice? Do you see what I mean? Mm. And, and send, yeah. these, send these guys up there. So she had obviously already made her name by then, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and obviously a lot of it doesn't exist. But Head later says that a guy told him who'd been hoovering up all this stuff, and he wrote it down. But that's what he said but other people have just said well he added it well like like he made it up but he, he never actually admitted to making it up he more yeah right he he, he did admit to um uh i don't know about fic what's the word Making it into a story from the fragments oh, he had. Okay, all right, embellishing a little bit. Yeah, kind of taking the fragments and building a narrative, especially of a young life and um, and this devil. You know, she's the spawn of Satan and all right, that. Right, right. I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, and but for 
everything I've read, everybody doesn't think she's an evil person. Yeah, I mean, there's I can't find a single reference anywhere, anywhere to anybody having a pop at her. Do you see what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I don't think. Um, I, I don't think that's really the case. Um, I, I would think I would think with her accuracy that later on people might get freaked out and just assume that she was evil. You know what I mean? Well, she was ugly. Yeah. Well, that didn't help either. And she had a wart on her nose, which I mean that that's not really that's not really you know a thing. I mean, you got wart on your nose. I mean, you know what 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 did you do to get the wart? I mean, that's a mark of a devil. What? What did her mother do? You were meant to be born yeah. with a board. Um, uh, I can only find everybody saying, basically, what a nice, sharp, friendly lady she was. Mm -hmm. I can't see anybody saying she cast a spell on my door. Nothing like that. Yeah? Right, right. There's no mention of spells. Yeah? Um and what is interesting is if you look back through the woodcuts, and I have, of um, of witches, uh, early witches, and I there was a, a pin interest page that some lady put together of witches, you were me, through the ages. And you, there's about 100 on there. And you, you just see, before her, for witches, you just see old women, even young mm -hmm. women, pretty women, ugly women, ordinary women, women with clothes on, you know, crossing their arms, um, basically wise women or even basically porno women, yeah? Yeah. But not, not with the hooky nose and the sticky out chin and the, yeah, that is absolutely starts with her. Huh. I, I, they, so if anybody else can prove me wrong, I'll be delighted to find it. I spent a week and didn't find it. So there we go. So then, so then let's let's just take it there that we. I mean, this is a in this time that we got, we can't possibly do all of it because it would take a week. I mean, there's there's a lot of material and. <sighs> good half of it questionable right the big, i mean the, the the big bit is finding out which half and um, so but this this woman obviously made a huge dent right and she got the attention of a cardinal who lived in hampton court palace yeah um a lot of your americans might not know that Cardinal Wolsey made himself to Hampton Court Palace and he made it at, basically by skimming the kings, kings and the and the uh, church's money, yeah? Uh. And he, he made it even better than Henry VIII's castle. Now, Henry hmm. VIII had 18 castles and this is better than any of them. <laughs> and Henry VIII thought... This guy needs taking down a peg. Anyway, um, his demise, as you can see, he ended up in a toilet in Leicester. So there right. we go. Yeah. <laughs> Interestingly, he must have been a hundred yards from. Uh, he must have been a hundred yards from um, Richard the Third's resting place. Hmm. Anyway, so so she obviously made this big. Then, right, and then Shakespeare picks it up, right? She prophesies um, a lot of other things, like uh, the destruction of London by fire, yeah? Okay. Uh, and lots of other things like that. I'm not going to get into them now because we'd easily run off the end of the time. But this is just a taster. If anyone's interested, I've given you the point as you can go and run with it, yeah? So... Anyway, she 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 predicts the uh, great the great uh, fire of London. Now Samuel Pepys, who a lot of your Americans will have heard of, was um, he's famous as a diarist. Yeah, 
if you want to know what was going on in Elizabethan and just after times, you read Samuel Pepys' diaries. They are all preserved. They're dated, timed. They're very accurate. He, he describes what he does with his wife and he describes what he does with his mistresses and how many mistresses and in detail, not much detail, but in detail. And the London is set on fire and everybody's taking everything they can carry out of London, yeah, that can, right? Mm. Including him, except he's got a cheese. Yeah, a cheese. Yeah as in Monterey Jack cheese, except this is, um, I think it's Parmesan, Parmesan, right? He's got a Parmesan tree cheese, which is very valuable, yeah? So London is burning all around him, and he thinks it's a good idea to get a shovel, dig an hole, and put his cheese in it, <laughs> cover it over, and leg it out of London. Right, and come back for it later, which he did, right? So, I mean, <laughs> personally, I would have just run. But, right. I, you know, greater man hath no man that he lays down his cheese for his life. Anyway, so it, it, <laughs> that was the sort of guy he was. Uh, and people laugh at him, and there are songs that are, are sung about him, like, we know it's right, it's in black and white, and it's all written down in his diary and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. and, right. Yeah, and things go on behind closed, behind closed curtains, but naughty Samuel Pepys, yeah, his name is Pepys. But he was in charge of the Royal Dockyards. Uh, Elizabethan and Jacobean time, in, uh, uh, not Jacobean, in um, Elizabethan and... Uh, in the Stuart times, yeah, the um, being in charge of the dockyards is like, well, you imagine that. And that's like being in charge of, well, you imagine it in America today. I mean, that that would be, oh, you'd, what, number three or number two or something for the prison? I mean, you'd be, yeah, well up there, yeah. So yeah. This, is, this is no idiot. Anyway, so he's there talking to Prince Rupert watching London burn, you know, like you do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Rupert, or one of his guys, I've forgotten which, says, this, this is exactly what Shipton predicted. Mm. And, and Peeps thought, that's interesting, and he wrote it in his diary. Um, so, you were me, she, she was... Her prophecies were common knowledge at that point in London, and Pepys doesn't fib. He tells stories in his diary that really put himself down, yeah? Yeah. So, I mean, he tells it like it is, and if he's been a bit of an idiot, you know, drunken too much and went to bed with the wrong girl, it's still in the diary. You get the picture? Right, yeah. Yeah. So, um... So we have it there. And then we, we crank things forward a bit. I and mean, it all goes bonkers in uh, in Victorian times, as we were saying earlier. I did say I'd come back to this. And uh, there's, in Victorian times, there's uh, an English thing called Punch and Judy. Now, in America, yeah. when I lived in America, which wasn't for long, um, they all thought that Punch and Judy was just synonymous with puppetry. You only hand puppets, that's it. It's a Punch and Judy show. In Britain, that's not the case at all. It's a very specific show. You only with a kind yeah. of semi-set storyline and each puppeteer will uh, have his variant on it, yeah? And mm -hmm. they'll probably make it... Um, uh, you know, bring it up to date by throwing in, in these days, Trump and Johnson and anybody else that they can take, make fun of. You and me, so they, they kind of keep, right. it, keep it fresh. Now, Punch and Judy, uh, Punch was a satirical guy. And if you look, uh, I think one of the prints I've put up on there, if you look at a side view on of Punch, and you look at a side view on of Ursula Shipton, you can't tell them apart. Right? Mm. Now, 
the, if you just read it straight, people say, oh, well, it inspired Punch and Judy, and that's where Punch and Judy comes from, which is not true. Because it, that actually comes, Punch and Judy show came from Italy, from a, an art form called uh, uh, Theatre of, uh, in Italian, Theatre of Art, right? Mm. Okay. Now, that survives, and you will have seen it in the circus, you know, like the Three Ring Circus, where you have Harley Quinn. Are you familiar with Harley Quinn? Uh I guy, know the name. Yeah, guy wears uh normally wears white tights and um uh brightly coloured diamonds in patterns all up and down his body and a funny conical hat. I'm sure a lot of the listeners are going, you know what I mean, Zariah? Anyway. <laughs> right. That is from it. That's one of the characters from he survived as you remember as a classic clown figure. Now I've told you and if you look up circus cl clowns, one of them probably is dressed like that. Yeah? Okay. In right. a troop. Right. Now, that comes from this school from Italy. You with me? So I look up and they say, oh, well, Punch and Judy came from a puppet show um, or and um, live theatre genre. Um, you know, this um, theatre of art. So I, I went and looked at it and I found Punch, yeah? And he's quite a good-looking guy. And he doesn't have this hook nose. And he doesn't have the sticky-out chin. Yeah? Hmm. He's just a regular guy. You could even say pretty. And um, so, they made this guy as basically uh, as a, um, a caricature, you know me, of Shipton. Okay. And... It's a it's a wonderful story. I mean, it's it, this. Is, don't forget, this is a children's entertainment at, yeah. the, at the seaside. Okay. Now, I went and saw one of these as a kid. Now, I gather they've cleaned it up now, but the the basic plot goes like this: um, Punch is a, a bit of a trump, yeah, and he he doesn't like um, authority, yeah, and his wife's screaming at him. So he gets this slapstick, uh, you know, great big pole thing, and he, uh, sorry, the baby's screaming its head off, and he doesn't like the baby screaming its head off, so he, he basically whacks the baby and kills the baby, or nearly kills the baby, yeah? So he calls for the doctor, so the doctor comes along and gives the, gives the baby an aspirin or something, yeah? And the, the puppeteer's blowing the baby's stomach up with a balloon, yeah? So now this, this baby then goes bang and dies, yeah? So Trump, uh, Trump, punch, <laughs> there, there's a, right, right. He, he, then, he then kills the doctor for killing his baby, yeah? His, mm -hmm. his wife is now nagging him that he shouldn't have, A, been nasty to the baby, and B, been nasty to the doctor, so he kills her, yeah? <laughs> so... <laughs> A policeman comes along and and arrests him and he's uh, sent along to the hangman. So he goes along to the hangman and he's just about to be hanged and he whips it off him and he puts it on the hangman and he hangs the hangman and then he hung the policeman, right? This is for children that are like under 10. <laughs> right? Now, in the middle of all that, they would have added, you and me, they would have probably renamed the policeman as Pencil, you and me, what, what, whatever. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Now, this form of satire was the foundation of um, the magazine Punch, which still is running today and was from the Hogarth Press. I and mean, you've heard of Hogarth probably. Um and um, basically, in those days, that's it's kind of Man Magazine meets um, Wall Street Times, yeah? Okay. That's so, a weird combo. <laughs> well, it is. That's exactly what it's like. You know I me? Mean? You've got serious articles and things just ripping the stuff out of them, yeah? So, hmm. it's um, very satirical. And there you go. There is 
Mother Shipton again, yeah? And then mm -hmm. we've got this, um, the final thing I'll leave it on is English pantomime. Oh, by the way, Punching Judy still exists in Britain. You can go to London. If you're on a trip to London, you can go to um, uh, Covent Garden, which is very central downtown, and you can watch an authentic, but I think politically correct if it's before nine after nine my guess is it's as it was before yeah right yeah so it still exists and it still exists in most major seaside towns and i gather in america there are a couple of valiant guys trying to keep it going and failing so that's that's the end of that but apparently there are more in canada so it still runs on so coming mm. to the final thing, we've got this thing called pantomime, which Americans just don't understand at all. Uh, I took an American to an English pantomime and he just open mouth was stared and wondered what on earth he'd parachuted into. Um, <laughs> it's right. Uh, it, it's like everything stuck on its head, right? So you've got a principal boy who's the hero who's actually a very, very gorgeous girl with extremely long legs and kinky boots, right? And a white wig. And then you've got uh, uh, the heroine, who is always a very pretty girl, but nevertheless playing against another girl who's a boy, right? Keep up. And then you've always got this villain, this woman, who is very ugly, and is a man in a woman in a woman's clothes, but obviously a man. Does that make sense? Yes. And we call that the pantomime dame. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and she can do outrageous things, of course. Yeah, because she's a caricature and she can say outrageous things about politicians or anything you like. Yeah. And normally, they're extremely funny comedians, men comedians. There is no real attempt to make them look like proper women. Do you mm. understand? Yeah. Right. It's kind of, Mon it's kind of Monty Python-esque. Well, that's where they got it from. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, the, the, one of the most famous pantomime dames, that's what they called them, was Arthur Askey. Now, Arthur Askey is a straight North Country mill town guy long dead um and he used to always play the pantomime dame so he would turn up with a you know a little bow peep hat and you know a, a long a long sort of dress with a hoop under it yeah and mm -hmm. but he would never wear false boots yeah none and so there was no attempt. Do you, do you see what I mean? Uh, yeah, and, yeah. And if you, in interview, they said, well, why don't you wear falsies? And, that, and they said, well, they come to see Arthur Askey. Mm. And I'm Arthur Askey. And I'm Arthur Askey with a frock on. And if you think I'm going to put, you know, padding up it, then I wouldn't be Arthur Askey. <laughs> I mean, that's fairly typical of... Uh, look up old mother Riley I mean I think that's an American version you guys had but um, the whole point of where I'm getting to with this is that the woman who's very ugly with a probably with a rubber hook nose and sticky out chin is again mother Shipton huh so she's just kind of disseminated through the culture without people really realizing it. Well, people realized it at the Victorian time when it all became famous and everybody's right. kind of forgotten it. Hmm. Um, so, so, yeah. With, with, with all the prophecies you read through, what, which ones impressed you the most? The, the earliest... The, the later on that you read, the more fanciful stuff gets. Do you, do you mm -hmm. follow me? Yeah. So I'm most impressed by the Woolsey one. Okay. Because that is, it would seem, documented, true, and happened. 
Okay, that makes sense. So that's the one I'm most impressed with. Um, I mean, the rest of it... Uh, I mean, I've, I've told you this before a few times. The more I look, the less I find. Mm -hmm. And as I go back and look harder, I find less and less and less. And that, that's generally what I find. It doesn't matter whether I'm chasing back frying saucers or, you know, it doesn't matter. It, it yeah, well, evapor well, evaporates well, as you get closer <laughs> to the original source. Right, because so much is added on to it over time. Mm. Um, what I'm impressed that this woman had such an impact that tonight in America there will be Little girls dressing up as Ursula Shipton and not having a clue why they've done it. <laughs> and and how how would you compare her to like the you know, Nostradamus? No, she was um, uh, Nostradamus had a. There must have been a lot more um, of Shipton stuff because if if she was known in London and the first real solid document we have is 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 um oh what's his name the Cardinal Wolsey yeah mm -hmm. sending three guys up the country I mean that's about as far as I don't know it's it's, it's 200 miles yeah 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 no mean thing yeah and and two yeah. of his three of his good guys um she must have been well known at that point, but I can't find documented stuff before the stuff I've just read you. Okay. But there must yeah. have been a lot more. Otherwise, why would he take any notice? Yeah. Uh, so that's why I'm in, I'm impressed with that. When I first came to it, I was dead impressed by there are men walking under the sea and all that until I found out that a guy actually owned up to writing that. <laughs> but I don't think that's important because I don't think the details of the prophecies are the story. I think there is a, a good woman who did some prophecy stuff and all across America tonight, she's still having an influence. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think that's quite remarkable. I, uh, I I do find that that final prophecy idea interesting, regardless of who wrote it, because it gives you that that sort of uh, cyclic uh, history sort of feel to it. That's not commonplace. Well, it's it's revelation with happy ending, isn't it? Um, except revelation doesn't say that. I mean, revelation says, "Oh, well, it's all going to go to worms and." And then, you know, Jesus will come down and then you've all got to behave yourself for a thousand years. So Right, right. Oh, hold on. Well, so it wasn't that catastrophic because the rest of us are still here for a thousand years and it'll be quite nice because it'll be peaceful and, you know, uh, well, <laughs> uh, I'm further downside yet. But if you look at... Um, that one that I that I read you about, you know, to, you know, a, a few people who start again. I mean, that is so archetypal. I mean, look at Day of the Triffids. Yeah, you got the true, Day of the true. Triffids. Everybody dies out, apart from people who were asleep or in a mine or something when the, you know, the uh, meteorites came and they weren't blind, so you, you know, you could escape from the Triffids, and there was only a few and. They populated the world again, and it's the same with, um, um, oh, God. Um, I, I guess what impresses me is the civilizer influence that, that seems to be present in that prophecy, you know, similar to Quetzalcoatl and stuff like that. Well, Watchers, it, as it, you said, you know. just the standard fable? I mean, 
Um, I mean, all you got to do is just put a PSC, the Georgia Guidestones, I mean, and you're all set, aren't you? I mean, <laughs> that's true. I was trying to think of the other one, War of the Worlds, yeah? War of the oh, Worlds. Yeah. Exactly okay. the same story. You've got, a, you've got a handful of people left to start again. But in this one, you've got a bunch of uh, spacemen who are going to start it all again. Well, maybe. But, I mean, Silver Snake can mean a lot of things. Well, no, and it said, it said, and men came out of it like people had never seen before. What do you make of that? Yeah, maybe a uh, d interdimensional portal. Yeah, right. And um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, now, the the guy. I mean, if if that was written by the guy that added the stuff, although he said he didn't add that bit. Um, well, you're, you're talking mid, mid, mid to, well, I don't know, just after the mid, I mean, people were talking about, you know, Jules Verne was talking about, you know, space guns to the moon and stuff. And right, right. I mean, there's another guy that people said, how, how did he get that right? I mean, how did he, how did he get the aqualung right? How did he get, well, if, if, if you actually check up, you find out that he used to go down the patents office and see what had been invented. Right. Really? Huh. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he found like ac early aqualung, actually a rebreather because the aqualung was invented by, Cousteau, but you know I me, mean? the rebreather was invented in Victorian times. Yeah. Yeah. So um, basically, everything that Jules Verne, the quote futurologist, it was either written in a scientific paper or already been demonstrated when he wrote it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. He just kind of expanded on the ideas that were already there. He just said, well, what if it worked? Yeah. And, yeah. and off he went. The one thing that he got right that hadn't been patented was the nuclear submarine mm. you look at his you look at his um, description of the power unit of the Nemo it's a nuclear power plant it's, it, it's, it's exactly a nuclear power plant to get near it you had to put on special clothes and you know and all the rest of it and it's very dangerous and you know Hmm. I mean, but on the other hand, I mean, Madame Curie was starting doing stuff, but I mean, she wasn't saying one day we'll be, you know, powering submarines on, on this stuff. Right, right. All right. Well, All right. You, have think, of, think, you, <laughs> you have a bunch of notes that no. you put together, and they're available on wheretheroadgo.com under the show notes, as well as some videos. Uh, anything you well, want to add be before when we've done? enabled it? That's true. Uh, no, I uh, I don't write books because they're already written. But what I do do is wander through them, and uh, if people are interested, follow up on what I've. The links I've sent you uh, will take them to, you know, pretty much where, know. where I've been. More, more than they'd want to know. Um, the <laughs> videos are worth seeing just because they're pretty. Um, okay. And um, um, no, I, I don't write books. They're already written. There is one that you should look at that I think I've put up there, which is there's a guy, a Victorian, who kind of done a did a debunk job. Mm-hmm. Except, uh, I'm not sure it would be a debunk job. He spent about five years of his life doing it. Um, and that's on there as well. And I can't remember the name of it, but it's there. And okay. what, what it is, is he went through all of the prophecies that he could find uh, at that point. And he went through them line by line um i think he was a clergyman or something yeah and putting mm. his um uh, his comments uh um, unbelievers you know believers would say he's a debunker but in fairness he took five years 
of his spare time doing this, and it's quite thorough. Um, okay. But what I would say is there's less to this to me the eye. <laughs> but nevertheless, at the core at the core of it, this woman did 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 shape a small piece of British and now American culture. And I think yeah. I think she deserves the credit. Nice. Yeah. All right. Well thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah, most welcome, sir. Our patrons help make this show possible. And I'd like to send an extra special thanks to all patrons pledging ten dollars or more. Allison Cook, Eric Hervin, Lindsay Marie Trebet, Super Inframan, Tim, Alex Whitcomb, Nadine, Demian Tallman, Edu Kamahort, Janet Bunderson, 36 Dingo, Maria, Nate Syria, Rob Drummond, Jennifer Campbell, Mike McGuire, American Rambler, Paul Buscini, Kevin, John Rutledge Foster, Eric Citron, Andy McNamara, Sasha Yorg, Matthias Sumby, Christopher Vaughn, Riker and Stark, Sean Cosgrove, Jose A., Roger Gonzalez, Craig Cisternos, Ray Benedetto, Lindsay Jackson K., Alfred Tuttle, Kevin Shrek, Patricia Guy Quinta, William Lovelace, Mark Brady, Chris is a hot dog a sandwich, John Eddy, and Carla Mahoney. Thank you all so very much. You help make this show possible. All right. As I said during the show, if you want to see a timeline and some other links, uh, John put together a lot of stuff relating to Mother Shipton and her prophecies, some videos, some PDFs, all kinds of stuff. You can find it all at wheredidtheroadgo.com. So if you're listening not from the webpage, which I'm assuming is most of you, just uh, take a hop over there and take a look. There's a ton of information for you, and I hope you enjoyed tonight's show. We obviously did that on uh, the, actually the day before Halloween, and he was talking a lot about how the uh, – which Halloween costume, that's why, even though this is initially airing a couple days after Halloween. All right. Um, again, if you have stories, we've been getting a bunch of them now. It's going to make some really interesting uh, listener story shows. Send them to stories at com. We'll see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons. And we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.